Well, um, I guess we've got an excuse for people <coughs> arriving a little bit late uh, this morning. There was uh, a, a very uh, fruitful Hacker, hacker Garden uh, session. I know at least two pull requests that uh, I saw are already committed to the Groovy code base from the results of everyone's efforts. So thanks everyone for all of that. And I'm sure there's probably uh, more stuff in the pipeline for various projects. So that's great. Um, as Soren mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, Groovy 2.5. It's uh, our old release that came out ages ago uh, at the, the opening of this conference. And uh, a little bit about uh, the Groovy 3 uh, roadmap as well. So um, as Soren mentioned, uh, OCI, uh, the, the company that uh, allows me to contribute to, to Groovy, and as well as being the uh, company that does a whole lot of open source stuff, including Grails and Micronaut. So um, please come and see us if you want to know more about OCI, th or, or come and visit the booth, or look us up online. So. Groovy by the numbers. There's, I guess if you go and were to look at all of the um, hype surrounding the different languages on the JVM, you'd kind of think, oh, Groovy must be like sixth or seventh um, on the list in terms of the amount of hype that's around. But it's, in fact, it's the, uh, the biggest language on the JVM outside Java in terms of uh, usage and, and downloads. And those numbers are still increasing. So it's, more that it's getting around about five million downloads a, a month at the moment, and that number just keeps growing each month. So by the end of this year, it should be yeah, a, a very, very healthy uh, amount of downloads per month. And um, the, the cadence, the, there's releases coming out. Uh, they're the ones over the last uh, few months. So you can see there's qu quite a few releases coming out. And um, it's great to have 2.5 out finally. It's a few things we, we, we wanted to have in 2.5 that we didn't quite get there, but we thought it was more important to get that out. And we'll get a few things tidied up uh, in some uh, maintenance releases as we go. Right, so um, 2.5 is the, the main thing I want to talk about. I'll stop talking about 2.6 very briefly, and then, I'm, then I want to uh, go into, into a little bit on, on 3 as well. What are the themes of uh, Groovy 2.5? AST transformation improvements. So maybe we should call them AST transformer improvements. We'd, we'd, we'd get some more hype. Um, that's an actual car that you can drive around in, apparently. I haven't uh, had the... Uh, the um, honor of driving such a car yet, but I'll have to put that on my bucket list. The uh, next item is uh, macros, which are kind of like s a super version of uh, AST transforms where you don't have to actually write ugly code anymore. You can write uh, uh, nice, uh, simple Groovy code. So the same code that you can use when you're writing uh, your Groovy production code can be the same thing that you use uh, when you're creating these advanced transforms, the kind of things I'll talk about. A bunch of sort of miscellaneous improvements, sort of a bit of a facelift across the, the whole code base. So there's over 300 uh, fixes and improvements to Groovy 2.5 compared to 2.4. So there's a lot of work that's been done. Um, you might not have heard much about it, but there's lots of uh, little bits and pieces that have been added that um, keep Groovy being productive and uh, keep it up to date with all the uh, other languages and things that are taking place. And trying to get it to run on JDK 9 and 10 better. We've done some improvements in 2.5. The bulk of those improvements are going to come in, in Groovy 3, but there's a, uh, a bit of stuff happening. So let's look at the first one of those, the first cab off the rank, which was, um, or the first transformer off the, off the rank, which was uh, AST transforms. Uh, the blue ones on that slide are the ones that are in Groovy 2.4. The green ones are the new ones that have been added. So you can see there was about 40, there's now about 50. Um, in, but in fact, a whole bunch of the existing ones have been revamped or improved as, as well. So quite a few of the existing ones there, you can see, have uh, been improved. There isn't a, a, one additional one that will be on my last or second last or third last slide, which is a groovy doc one, which is only in 2, 6, and 3, but we'll, um, we'll get to that uh, a little bit later on. To give you a flavor of the sort of kind of improvements, when, I, when I'm mentioning some of these have been improved, here's our tuple constructor. So the blue annotation attributes there are the ones that were in 2.4. You can see a whole bunch of them have been added in um, 2.5. And it's not just that there's a whole bunch of extra new bells and whistles, new shiny stuff in all of these AST transforms, but the consistency across all of the AST transforms has been greatly improved. So if you used to go and, you know, you used to be able to go and see an all properties thing in one of the transforms and it wasn't in another one where it would probably make sense to be in the other one, you'll probably now find that it's in uh, both those transforms. So there's a lot of uh, consistency work that's been done to sort of 
make all those transforms rock solid and the kind of thing you'd want to be using in your, in your production code. Two um, big areas that where there was a, sort of a total revamping of the uh, original transforms was canonical and immutable. And they're probably two of the more commonly used uh, transforms in, in, many groovy, uh, in a lot of Groovy code bases. And they've been totally revamped to make them much more flexible and allow you to actually do custom versions of these uh, transforms much more easily. So canonical is now what's called a meta annotation or an annotation collector. So that's a facility that Groovy's been su supported for quite a little bit of time now, but um, it's, um, we're making more and more use of it. You'll see uh, other frameworks like Spring is now using uh, meta annotations as well. So the concept is actually um, now becoming more widespread. And a meta annotation is just one annotation that actually represents a bunch of other annotations. So I, I can put canonical as my annotation, and in fact, it just gets converted into the, these other three. And you might wonder, well, what magic um, is in, do you need to do to make that sort of thing happen? Well, this is the definition of uh, canonical. That's the, that's the code in the Groovy code base for defining canonical. And you can see there's just a list of uh, the three annotations there. It's just a normal annotation definition. So you can go and write one of those yourself, and, but maybe have a custom version of it and, and tweak things. And I'll show you examples of how you might do that a bit later on. There's one line there that um, you may not sort of understand. What's this prefer explicit merged? Well, if you actually had canonical and toString, you put both of those annotations on your class, what should happen? Should the, if you have annotation attributes in toString, should they be preferred over the ones in canonical, or should they merge, or should they ignore one of them, and so on? Um, or should you just dupe it up and have turn canonical into three, but keep the toString, so you've now got two toString's? So they're all possible behaviors that, that you... Um, might wonder which of those occurs. You've, you can actually control which of those occurs by putting a little um, mode when you define these, uh, a meta annotation. And so in this particular case, it's going to allow you to ha actually have that canonical and, and have two string, and it's going to prefer the ones in the two string. So it'll override any that were mentioned in canonical. And this is, um, for us, this was important for backwards compatibility with uh, earlier versions of Groovy that have got the, um, the old fat canonical uh, transform instead of this uh, slim down meta, meta, meta version. And to um, show sort of how that works, there's canonical and it's got uh, three annotation attributes. Uh, reasonably early on in the compilation process, it just gets converted into those other three. And any of the annotation attributes get automatically palmed out to wherever uh, they're defined within the component uh, annotations. So you can see there the cache went to two, went to two string and equals and hash code. But think something like you said has just went to tuple constructor because it's the only one of those annotations that supported that attribute. So it, it all works as you might expect. Things just uh, end up being where they need to be. So, so that's all well and good. Same happened with immutable. But in fact, uh, we, we, we used to have, um, we used to get a lot of feedback on immutable saying, can you make it do this? Can you make it do that? Oh, I like what it does, but I'd like this to part to be different. And we, to, in order to uh, meet the needs of all the requirements that were coming in, we'd end up with like 40 or 50 annotation attributes on, on the, that annotation. It would have started to become unwieldy and it would be this very, very fat thing. And even, even after all that work, people would still say, oh, yeah, but I don't like this one aspect of it, so I can't use immutable anymore. Or they'd go and, you know, we'd, we'd go and create an immutable two that was sort of like immutable but had a few things different. And then we'd have lots of dupe in those annotations. So instead, we said, well, you know, we're in this era of uh, uh, microservices and so on. We should just make everything fine-grained, and then we can mix and match and combine things together. And so that's what we did with uh, Immutable. It actually gets split up into nine fine-grained uh, pieces. And you might, some of them lo um, might look very familiar to you. You'll, you will have seen them before. Other ones might look a bit strange, and you're not, not quite sure what they are. But there's... Um, there's a lot of uh, thinking went behind what's the appropriate um, facilities that you need, and you can now actually combine these and mix and match. And so the good thing about this is that if, if you want to actually, if you don't like the choices we made in Immutable, there's lots of uh, extension points or uh, ability for you to go and change things. So um, I'll show you a couple of examples of this later on, but... Um, if you don't like our definition of immutable, you can just cut and paste those nine annotations, put them in the file like the, previous, uh, the, the code on the previous slide, 
and then just change the one or two things that you don't like. Now you've got your own custom annotation. You didn't need to uh, do any coding at all, and you, you can now actually use that all throughout your code base. So it's um, very, very powerful. Just to give you one example, I'd like something that's immutable, but I don't want all the stuff that's in immutable. In fact, I don't want a map constructor. I don't want um, various bits and pieces. So what I'm going to do is I, I can, uh, with a surgeon's knife, I can go in and grab a mutable base. That's going to check a bunch of things that um, I'm not doing anything stupid that would make my class um, violently non... Uh, it would, uh, it would um, violate lots of things that you'd want a mutable class to, uh, to support. I'm going to go and grab a property options um, little annotation, which is a very fine-grained thing that gets used when you're when the code for your constructor is being defined and the code for your getters is being defined, it goes and looks at this prop, because that's getting and setting properties, um, it goes and looks at this property options and it can tweak the behavior if it sees something different there. In this case, I'm just going to go use the one that Immutable had, so I don't want to write any extra code, and I'm going to go defaults equals false. And that's going to, that's, I'm not going to have a map constructor because that's, um, not some, that's something that's in Immutable, but it's, it's not in Canonical. And by going defaults equals false, I'm actually just going to get a single tuple constructor, not a, um, if, if you have multiple parameters, Groovy's expansion would give you uh, multiple constructors. With some, uh, it'll override that. You'll get a single one. So this is actually going to give me a mutable object that's actually friendly towards uh, dependency injection. So, and I didn't have to write any code and do any magical, weird, and wonderful things there. I just went and mixed and matched a few bits and pieces out of those uh, the, the menu of options we now have, and, and uh, there we go. We've got um, s some new thing, which is uh, some of value. What else happened with Immutable? It now supports all of your java.time classes. So a lot of uh, people are, are sort of um, treating the uh, Java util date and Java util calendar as sort of legacy classes and uh, trying not to use those as much. And they're wanting all of the, the new java.time classes, so we support all of those. We can, um, I showed you that special canonical remix of Immutable. Um, I can just go and use Immutable and actually just specify a different property handler. So when w the property handler that, Groovy, that comes with Groovy is Immutable, it does all the things you need to do for defensive copy in, defensive copy out, for things like lists. And we just go and use the, the built-in uh, collections classes for making things uh, uh, it, for making immutable classes. So um, there's, we use all those collection libraries. Perhaps you don't use those collection libraries. Perhaps you use Guava or, or some, o some other library using one of the other persistent libraries that are around. You can just go in and tweak and write your own little uh, immutable property handler. And that's it's like, like writing a little transform. It's not much code at all. And in this case here, we've written one for Guava. And now we just, we just go and put that on our immutable classes and all of the Whenever it's going to do with the defensive copy in, defensive copy out, you'll get Guava immutable, immutable lists there. So very, very powerful features. Immutable handles optional. So if you've um, uh, decided to use uh, optional from, from Java 8 throughout your code base, you can happily create uh, immutable classes using that as well. That'll be fine. It uh, won't let you cheat. If you go and try to do... Obviously, for an immutable class, you want the, the types of all your properties to be immutable things themselves or things that you, can know, you know how to handle in a safe way, with like the defensive copy in, defensive copy out. If you go and try and cheat and uh, you have an optional of something that's, not, uh, that, that's mutable, it won't, it won't uh, let you do that unless you go and... So here I've got uh, Java AWT point. That's a mutable class within in, um, Java. If I go and try to make a uh, mutable class using that, it'll, um, it'll object. I can, of course, go and tell it that point is one of the known immutables and I can make this work. If, if I'm, I know within that class and within all of my code base I'm, I'm not uh, doing things that would um, make things go awry if, if someone mutates that under, underneath me. Another thing that's actually spread through a lot of the transforms is property name validation. So again, one of the themes that's been happening in, in Groovy over the last little while is, yes, we want to still support the dynamic behavior of group, but we want more um, static uh, behavior as well. And we, we get that, a lot of that with at type checked and, uh, and at uh, compile static. 
but there was little holes. So if I, I'm, I've gone and checked all my types and checked all, of, all the usages of, of, of things inside my class, but if in my um, excludes list in this two string here, I misspelt my property name. So I've got here I've got first instead of first name. I, made, I renamed something and I, I forgot to rename one bit of it. That won't compile either now. That'll, that'll uh, give you an error. So um, it'll uh, complain about that. The nice thing about that, that's just a little library and you can actually just call that library when you're writing your own transforms as well. So you can keep that consistent behaviour uh, going out throughout uh, additional transforms if you want to have that feature as well. I mentioned the, the defaults before earlier when I was saying it's, it's a nice way to get a um, dependency injection friendly um, tuple constructor. Just elaborate a little tiny bit on that. We don't, uh, um, don't really need to go into sort of low level detail in today's talk, but just some of you will find it interesting. Um, here we've got uh, two classes. I've got a flight class and a cruise class. And the one's got a from city and a to city. The other one's got a from port and a to port and both got a leaving date. I'm leaving on a cruise tonight. So that's obviously where this example uh, was inspired. And um, what does, what does Groovy do it, with the tuple constructor? Well, in the first case, it just generates the, because you've got defaults equals false, it just generates all your property uh, values there as parameters for that constructor. In the normal case, which is down the bottom, it actually puts defaults there. Now, because I didn't bother specifying any initial values for my properties, they've all, they all just look like null in this case, which isn't very interesting, but it serves the purpose of uh, showing you what would happen. So if I'd gone and had um, the leaving date was by default today's date or something, then you would see one of those parameters wouldn't be null, the last one there, and it would actually have some sort of value in it. Um, but that's all the tuple constructor does. It just goes and um, either makes the first type of constructor and then this, or the second type of constructor. Then the Groovy compiler kicks in and it does, it does its normal thing. And Groovy would give you different uh, variations for those two things just as part of normal compilation. That's how it actually uh, implements the, the default parameters. Because the JVM doesn't support default parameters, but, but Groovy um, does all the right bytecode to make that happen. So Groovy would go and convert the bottom one into actually four overridden constructors there. So one with three parameters, one with two, one with one, and, and the NOAA constructor as well. Um, that's really useful if you're just wanting to create a class and then start using it, and if you want to leave off some of the parameters from the right to the left, you can uh, happily do that and you'll get whatever the default values are. In my case, they'll be null, which may not be very interesting, but that same behavior would apply if they were set to something. Um, if you've got a dependency injection framework, many of those don't like multiple constructors. They want to find a single constructor um, and inject it. If you, if you have multiple, you've often got to give, do more work to tell them uh, which one to go pick. Um, so you often just want to have a single one, and that's what the first one will give you. So now, now that's easy to configure. And as we saw before, you can be mixing and matching this with canonical or mutable or with your own, own uh, custom things as well. One of the other things, and again, for this was for both immutable and canonical. Um, one of the comments that we always got was, oh, can you go and change immutable to go and allow me to do some validation or call some validation method or whatever? So they, they like the idea of all the boilerplate stuff for setting properties to be set inside the constructor, but they, uh, many people wanted extra stuff to happen and they were trying to find conventions. Uh, you know, please, write, please allow me to call a init method in my class or something like that. So we, we, we got lots of uh, suggestions on what people wanted. And we weren't really happy with any of those because it kind of polluted the, the domain object that you were creating. So we, what we did was we put pre and post uh, closures as options on tuple constructor and map constructor. So they're the things that we use when we're generating the boilerplate uh, property setting code in your, in, in your constructors. Now you can go and set either of those. The pre will be called before all the set type operations are done and the post afterwards. And you can do th uh, little things like validation and so on in, th in those little methods. So um, that's kind of handy. Just to um, give you an example of uh, some of the other things that was, were there, I sh one of the things that was in that big long list of uh, operations for immutable was a thing called uh, visibility options. And um, 
that allows you to override the behavior of uh, various annotations now. Various annotations now support that. So tuple constructor is one of them. And normally, if you put tuple constructor on a class, you'll get a public tuple const uh, constructor. But perhaps that's not what you want. Maybe you want a private one. And again, there was lots of uh, suggestions that we had for please allow me to put an extra annotation attribute to, to change the visibility, or maybe it should be an enum, or maybe it should, you know, so there was lots of things. This actually gave us a very flexible way to make this work across uh, a whole range of the annotations. So you can put visibility options. It works with a, a bunch of the uh, internal AST transforms, and, you, and we'd recommend you go use that if you need to change visibility in, in your own transforms as well. So you use this as a, a nice way to keep um, consistency across all of the transforms. So in this particular case, I, I want all the boilerplate for my constructor to be created. It actually turns out not to be very much because I've only got one property in this class, but ignore, ignore that fact for now. Um, so I want all the boilerplate for my constructor to be created, but I don't want that to be visible to anyone because I want to go and do something different. Maybe I want to um, uh, do some tiny bit of business logic. And the way I'm going to control that is I'm going to make a factory method. So here I'm, I've got a static pub, a public static factory method, make person, and it's going to call that constructor, but because that constructor is private, it's, it's not going to be something that's going to be available to other people. Unless you cheat and, and look at private stuff. But anyway, we won't, we won't talk about that. Okay, I already showed uh, immutable, and it got split into things, including a map constructor. And you kind of might wonder, uh, why do we need this sort of map constructor? It doesn't Groovy sort of support um, this thing called named arguments, and it sort of uses a map-like notation. It, well, in fact, it does. But you, in order to understand why having a map constructor transform is useful over and above what Groovy would do for you by default, you kind of need to go down one level and just understand a little bit of the details. If I go and call a constructor, uh, the conference constructor down there, and I supply a map, if I'm just using uh, boilerplate Groovy and I've got no transforms or anything, and I've got no explicit constructors declared or anything like that, what Groovy will do is it'll call the noarg constructor, and then it'll call all the setters of all your properties and set them all. And that's, that works really well, and, and in many scenarios, that's all you need. Um, you, can, you can actually tweak things a bit. If you actually went and uh, supplied a explicit map constructor, you can actually go and um, get that to be called instead of the noarg and then the setters. Groovy will look for that first. If it finds it, it'll call the map constructor. And uh, if it doesn't find it, it'll call the noarg and then it'll call the setters. And all, all of that happens transparently to you. You don't need to know that that's what Groovy's doing. It's kind of just replacing one Groovy line with three Java equivalent lines, or four, four Java equivalent lines if I've got three properties. Um, that's all well and good, but there's certain scenarios where this isn't quite what you want. And one of those scenarios might be, uh, what if I wanted to make all my properties final? Okay. Now, in that case, if I'm calling the noarg constructor, I'm going to go set all those things to null or some default value, and then my setters are going to get called and going to try to change things, and it's, and it's not going to work. So in that scenario, if you put map constructor on there, um, any users of your class won't know any different because they'll still use the named arguments exactly as you've been using before. But you'll now be able to make those uh, final, and it, you'll have a map constructor. Groovy will see the map constructor. It'll call that, and you can go set all those properties, and it'll all happen in, in one foul swoop. So that's very nice. And um, again, the scenarios with dependency injection where having, having that map constructor is, uh, can be useful, or Java integration in general, I guess, where having that constructor can be a useful thing if I'm trying to call from a uh, from Java code, Kotlin code, whatever I might be trying to do for integration purposes. One of the, another area, again, this is fairly minor, but it's, uh, I've used it quite a bit in uh, little testing scenarios. You, you may, may or may not uh, find it useful yourself. But um, certainly I've used a lot of Groovy's uh, dynamic behavior for creating uh, sort of proxy objects. So on the, perhaps looking at just the second line example there, the empty iterator, I'm declaring a map, and I've got has next as the key to, uh, as the uh, key to one uh, one field of the map, and I've got false as a closure as the value in that map, and then I go as iterator. Groovy goes. This is dynamic. Groovy goes and creates a proxy, 
that implements the iterator interface. So if I go and check if this thing's an instance of iterator, it will be. Um, if I go and call has next on it, um, it's going to return false. If I go and call it size, it'll return zero because it'll, uh, that's the, um, the size method on iterators that uh, uh, Groovy uh, gives you is going to check has next first and so on. Um, so that's all the dynamic Groovy, and that can be really, really handy when you're doing testing without having to create lots of uh, sort of dummy classes that you then feed into your test cases. If you actually um, want to do the same thing, but you don't want all of this dynamic behavior, this dyna this, uh, the dynamic features of Groovy, auto-implement will be your friend. So it'll let you do that same sort of thing, but actually create real classes for you with, with um, all the stuff implemented. So all I need to do is go auto-implement, put it on my class, and it'll go and look at whatever things I'm extending. Here I've got I'm extending abstract list, I'm implementing a couple of interfaces, and it'll, uh, by default, it'll just go and give you all the methods that, are, that it finds that are abstract. Yep, it'll go fill them in. And the default behavior is it'll just return null for any objects, and it'll return the primitive values, the default primitive values, so zero for all your numbers, basically, and false for booleans. And any void methods, it'll just ha they'll be empty in returning void, anything uh, void, void return type. So that'll, that'll um, give you a class there. That class will be testable if you've got a Java um, class that works with um, iterators or whatever, you can feed this to those Java classes and they'll happily run it, they won't know any better that it was a generated class. And so you can do test a whole bunch of testing scenarios and be using Groovy and, and uh, things work out very nicely. You can tweak it, um, we, yeah, we don't need to confirm things there. You can tweak it if you don't want that default behavior of uh, returning nulls and um, things like that. You can say, oh, always throw an exception or always throw an exception with a particular message, or in fact, run this bit of code in inside each of my methods. In this case here, I'm going to manually throw an exception with a date parameter fed into it. So you've got um, you know, some nice possibilities uh, that you can tweak things as well. One of the other things that uh, there's often a debate on in, uh, if, uh, if you're trying to do Agile and trying to go to uh, turn the dials up to 11, um, you might think, oh, I've got to use finals everywhere. Um, but then another group will say, well, finals are just cluttering up your code and making it harder to read, and reading code is much more important than um, uh, s sort of uh, the, the, s the slight benefits that, that finals, you know, it, you shouldn't be writing. So finals going to stop you doing stupid things like changing a parameter. You should not be writing a method that's so long that you'll ever have the chance of changing a parameter. You should only be writing very small methods. So so some would say, don't put final everywhere. It just clutters up the code and makes it harder to read. And some would say, no, you need them everywhere. It's going to force you to do the right things everywhere. Um, if you put auto final on your class, you can leave final off everywhere, and it'll just go and put them on everywhere. So you can just, uh, you don't need to clutter up your class, but you can still have uh, the benefit of final there. And it'll leave it off if you, you can do it at the class level or the method level, and it'll, or method or constructor. Uh, delegate is something you are, um, have always been able to put on a uh, property. You can now do it on a getter of a property, so that can be kind of handy if uh, perhaps you um, create that uh, property lazily or use a different property depending on um, some sort of circumstance. Um, you might be round-robbing round robbing on a, a list of um, delegate properties to sort of share some workload or something. Um, you've got some more flexibility there. Okay, there's another um, thing called name variant, and um, this is actually really powerful, but hopefully m you guys will mostly never ever see this. So named variant is something that we're kind of uh, retrofitting into the, the Groovy code base in various places to actually allow type checking to be occurring in places where it's very dynamic at the moment. So if you go and use SQL.new instance, there's a map variant for that that lets you feed in a bunch of properties. And if you go and some of those properties are, are sort of like booleans and some are strings and some are uh, classes. Um, at the moment, they're just objects when you're feeding them in. So there's no type checking that gets done on any of those. So you can actually use these, the, the things I'm talking about, name, param, name, variant, and so on. Um, can be, we can go use in the Groovy code base and produce a version that's going to get type checked. It'll look the same to you. You'll use it the exact same way as you get before, but you'll be able to get type checking on it. So you'll actually get, be able to go and retrofit some of your classes uh, with the same capability. But I 
best, I'll just, I'll just describe the capability first, and then I'll tell you that, yeah, a lot of the times you won't ever see uh, this level of detail. So, um, here I've got a constructor, and I'm writing the constructor by hand. And I've done a tuple constructor. So that's all well and good. Um, one interesting thing is I've made it private. So in fact, even though I've made an explicit uh, tuple constructor with all the types, it's not what I want my, the users of my class to be using. I actually would prefer them to be using uh, Groovy's friendly name parameter map style. But I didn't write a map one there. I didn't use map constructor. Um, I've gone and used name variant. And the reason why uh, we do that is, in our case, in this case here, all I've done, all the code that's inside here is just the boilerplate properly setting stuff. So this would be a really good candidate to just use map constructor. But in general, I might have a large slab of code in here with business logic. Yeah? And wouldn't it be nice because I'm now writing the code, that it all got type-checked. If I go and make the map variant that would make, make all my users have a friendly uh, experience, then me, as the writer of the code, won't get any type-checking. Yep, because I'll have a map for, of objects. So I'm going to go and uh, do the longhand. I'm going to put all the types in. All the business logic code that I put in here is now going to get type-checked. Now, I don't... The fact that I've gone and put types everywhere, I don't necessarily want to put that burden on uh, users of my class. So I go named variant, and it goes and does a boilerplate version, a map, map constructor that calls into this one. Yep. So now the code that I'm writing by hand all gets checked, but I can have all, all my users can uh, use the friendly version of this class. Now, in this particular case, I made the one I was writing private, so no one else will see it. And I put visibility, uh, by default, if I just go named variant, it'll make a map version with the same visibility as, as whatever the uh, constructor or method that I'm uh, annotating. By putting visibility options public, I've now got a public version. That's the one that people are going to see. That's what they'll be using, the, the uh, friendly map-based version, and it'll call into this. Okay? This is what the map-based version will uh, look like. And you can see it's, uh, it's uh, got a map. And all of the type information is still here. So in fact, the Groovy type checker can still do type checking even when the users of my class are using that map ver version. Okay, now, it's not all turned on. Some of it's turned on now. Not all of it's turned on. But over time, we'll turn more and more of that on so that you'll get um, full type checking. And we'll go and re retrofit this on um, SQL.new instance and you know, other places throughout the code base that have got that map style already there, we'll go and do this type checking and you'll, you'll get uh, more type checking in the future. And you can go and do this and make some of your classes have this type checking capability without burdening your users to, to force them to, to not be able to use the friendly uh, map style. Um, it's actually a little bit more powerful than I've I alluded to, as well as, um, so, so here's, I put name variant on this uh, foo method now, not a constructor anymore, a method. And it's got uh, four parameters. Uh, the first one, I'm not, uh, I, I didn't put name pram or anything on. Uh, it'll actually just be a normal parameter. So I'll create a map for all my named arguments, and then I'll have a normal parameter as well. Um, the second argument, string s2, will be a name parameter in my map, and it'll have key s2. So that's kind of what you might expect. Um, then I've got a thing called color, which is just R, G, and B, uh, some sort of three integer values. And I've got a thing called animal, which is something with a type and a name. And what's actually going to happen, I've used name delegate there instead of name param. So in this case, it's not going to have uh, shade and pet as the key. It's going to have all the properties of color and all the properties of animals as the keys. Yeah? So I can now call foo, and I can go S2 is an S2, and G is, uh, my RGB values are 12, 42, 12. My animal values, the types of dog, and the name is Rover. And then I just can pass through my extra parameter that wasn't one of the, the named ones, which was S1 in my case. Okay, and that's all going to get passed through. And if you look at sort of how it happens, all of the keys that are, are possible properties of all the things that I'm feeding in there all get the type information embedded in the, uh, as annotation information. 
Then I get my map, and you can see here that it actually pulls out RGMB from the map and doesn't add color on those. So it actually is returning a color to the uh, original variant. That um, my original one, my original method still stays there. I can make it private and make it sort of disappear. But it's expecting a color parameter and a pet parameter. The version that gets created is just a map, so it's just got a bunch of keys, and things are getting fed in into the right spot. Does that make sense? Excellent. So you can see it's very, very, very powerful. It's very rare that you need to have things as elaborate as this example, but if you do need it, um, very, very powerful, and the type checking remains there. So someone who's using a client who's using this bottom uh, syntax here, using the, uh, that map to check it, if... Uh, for the, for the dog's name, instead of being Rover as a string, I put 42 there or something, I'll get a, a type check error telling me that that's the wrong type for my animal, animal's name. Okay. Uh, Newify, got a little tweak. If you remember what Newify is, it allows you to leave off the new keyword. There's a couple of different flavors you can use. Um, there's like a Ruby style flavor and a, and a Python style flavor. Um, in the first example there, I've, I've got a, a, some sort of tree and leaf classes that I've defined earlier, and um, I don't want to have new everywhere, so I can have just have branch and leaf, and um, that gets expanded into the constructor calls because I've, got, um, I've listed the classes that I want to be auto-expanded up, up the top. You can now just use a regex pattern and get that same expansion, and you can go A to Z dot star or whatever and get all classes if, if that's the kind of thing that you want to do as well. Macros, so we're on to the, uh, the next uh, super transform uh, topic in our themes. So macros are, are very, very powerful. And um, I imagine many of you won't necessarily uh, use this all the time, but for anyone who's writing those transforms that I was just showing you, uh, this makes your life much, much easier. So when I uh, go and write one of those transforms, I'd have to do a lot of low-level code previously. Now I can write Groovy code, the same kind, and, and my mind, the mindset, what I'm thinking of is the exact same mindset as when I'm writing Groovy code. Okay, I've still got to know a little bit about what transforms are and how, how, the, the, the li how they fit into the compiler lifecycle and stuff like that, but the code I write can be much, much simpler. And this opens up um, writing this, these sorts of transforms to a much uh, bigger pool of people. You don't need to be compiler gurus necessarily to, to, to um, make all this work. So to sort of give you a, a, f a feel for how this works, if I was writing um, something like the at to string or the name delegate, some of those things we we're just showing you, newify, I'd, uh, it's, it's code that the, um, augments the compiler. And the compiler's got an abstract, abstract syntax tree representing my code, and so I've got to know about the, c the types that the compiler is using to represent that abstract syntax tree. So things like a class node, which has method nodes in it, and a method node might have, a, a, um, it might have parameters, it might have a return uh, type, the, it might have a block of code, the block of code might have exp uh, statements, which might have expressions inside, there might be binary expressions when I'm adding numbers. So there's a whole bunch of uh, data structures that I need to know about. And previously, you'd have to sort of make use of all of those. Um, now you write the code that uh, you want uh, Groovy to turn something into, and it goes backwards and uh, works. It basically, it's almost like it compiles it, and what, what the result of it doing the compilation is what it feeds in at that point in time. So it means, so the, the, these statements up here are actually doing return new date. So I need to go uh, new date, I need is a constructor call. So I need to create a constructor call expression on the date class. Um, the compiler needs to know about the date class, so I do a class helper dot make date, and it goes and finds the date class and uh, resolves it if need be, and finds its uh, no, it needs to know about what what methods the date might have, and so on. Um, and the, the standard new date, uh, I'm calling it without any arguments. So if we feed that in, that's what I was trying to do uh, by those previous statements. Now I just re write return new date. And um, that's the result of uh, it, get, it gets done for me automatically. So that's uh, very, very useful. It um, actually allows uh, variable substitution. So often, so, so this is examples all well and good, but 
perhaps I'd, I want to feed in a parameter or something, and, and I might have gone and already calculated that parameter. Um, so, so what I uh, need to do is be able to mix and match places where I wanted to do all this macro expansion, and then other places where I know what goes here, and I'm going to tell you what goes here. And there's a little syntax, $V syntax. Um, here in this particular example, I've already gone and calculated some variable expression x and another one y. And now I want to, this is just uh, uh, Pythagoras' theorem. We're going to uh, write some code that uh, implements that. Because I've gone and look, uh, already pre-calculated x and y, I, um, I'm doing math.square root, and then I want it to just go and plug in something I've pre-calculated. And then I'm going to go, that's squared, um, and then my, I want it to just plug in what I've pre-calculated and squared and, and do dot int value. Now, if you don't understand what's going on here, don't be too concerned. But to, for me to write that in the uh, longhand expression, if I was writing one of these uh, AST transforms, it might be 20 lines of code. Now it's just one line of code, and I can uh, mix and match between the old school and the new school and, and happily... Um, do all those things, and, and so writing these transforms is, is much, much simpler, and it's uh, there's a greatly reduced chance of uh, me getting something wrong because I've used the wrong, um, I haven't set something up properly, I haven't uh, used the, the right class in the right way, and so on. So what do you, the, the fact that macros are here, maybe you won't use them uh, in your everyday use, uh, but if you do need to do something in the transform space, it'll be a lot easier for you to do that, and what you will find is that the more frameworks will, can um, be now uh, easily produced in the Groovy ecosystem uh, because of this capability. So you'll see more frameworks popping up. Well, that's the, that's the um, intention, the, the hope. See how we go. Okay. You can also specify compiler phases and stuff like that. We don't really need to, to worry too much about that. Now, um, so this macro thing that I showed on this slide here, um, it allows you to produce expressions or statements. So this is sort of um, when I talked about the data structures that the compiler might be uh, thinking about. It might have a class node with method nodes in it, and then there's code inside uh, uh, each method, which will be a block statement. Inside that block statement will be a whole bunch of statements, and those inside those statements will be a whole bunch of expressions. Macros let me create all the things down at that level. Sometimes I want to create things like whole classes, um, but this notation that we've got here, where I, where I go macro and then I have a closure, it's not valid syntax to, to jam a whole class definition in there. You can't inside a closure, you can't jam a whole class definition. So we can't use the same trick and hope to get a whole class. So uh, instead, there's an alternative uh, s syntax in order to, to get into the macro uh, s expansion capabilities, and it's just you, you go re return new macro class. It's almost like you were defining an anonymous inner class, but you, ha you have your class definition inside there. Yep, and it's it's really you can whenever you see that syntax, t you could almost just think, oh yeah, that's just macro, but it looks a bit uglier because there's, there's no valid way to, to put a uh, closure definition at that point. So return new macro class is a, is a way in which this is achieved. And it does all the same thing with variable substitution and, and so on. So this is really great. You can actually create whole classes now um, using this capability. And, and the amount of code you'd need to, to do that, you'd have to be creating uh, new new class nodes, adding method nodes, adding block statements, adding exceptions, adding return types. So this could actually be like 100 lines of code is now just shrunk into something really small, and the chance of me getting something wrong is greatly reduced. So all my um, modifiers for uh, whether it's public or protected or private, all is, is going to be set for me automatically. All the return types are set for me automatically. Any exceptions that I've got there are set for me automatically. They're all the details that of, often take time to put in, uh, or op, you can often uh, slightly uh, muck up. So uh, this makes things a lot easier. Now, that's all well and good. So when would you use macro or macro class? When you're writing transforms, you've got an AST tree, and you're either putting new blobs of stuff in, so like where um, we're adding a new method into a class. So one of our transforms might be adding a two-string method. 
So we're adding a blob of tree into a tree. So we're, we've got a big AST tree and we're putting a blob in. Um, now we've got macros, creating that blob is really easy. Uh, another thing you might be doing is transforming or tweaking stuff. So you've got to go and find a blob and you rip out the old blob and put a new blob in there, a modified version of what you're ripping out perhaps. Um, again, macros make creating the new blob that you're going to be putting in, in that transform scenario really easy. But the actual finding where I'm going to rip out the old blob, um, you'd still have to kind of do old school. You'd still have to walk down uh, an AST tree and can be cumbersome and difficult to, to find that. So in fact, there's a mechanism called AST Matcher, which I, I can actually use the same technique for, for specifying blobs when I'm creating the blob to put in to specify a blob that I'm looking for. And uh, that's what AST Matcher will, allows me to do. And here's how it works. The blob that I'm looking for, in this case here, my reference pattern is macro 1 plus 1. So I'm going to look through my... Um, uh, what the, well, the, matcher's, the matcher and the visitor pattern that's going to be in place when I'm using this uh, are looking through the code and it's looking for 1 plus 1 anywhere in my code. And inside this transform here, that's the, there's going to be a visitor pattern happening that's, when, that's walking the tree. It, at every point in the tree, it stops and it says, here's the blob that's at this point in the tree. And the AST matcher says, does that match my reference pattern? Yep, so it's walking the tree, walking the tree, and then it finds a blob that matches the reference pattern, 1 plus 1, and says, yes, I found a match. And in our case, we, we say, okay, we're inside a transformer, we're going to be transforming blobs. Now return the blob, just the constant 2. Yep. What, so what this is doing, this is creating an optimizer that runs at compile time that's optimizing my code, getting rid of... Um, so previously in my code, at uh, runtime, I'd have to add the number 1 to the other number 1. Um, now I'm going to do that at compile time. Yep. So I've got an optimizer for my code. And you might think, well, that's great, Paul. Can you write me the optimizer for 1 plus 2 now? And what about 2 plus 1? And what about 2 times 2? And if, if this was all that um, was supported, yes, it would, it, oh, I haven't really gained very much. But in fact, I can have uh, placeholder expressions. I think I've just hidden the slide to shrink my deck down that showed those. But what I can say is, um, instead of 1 there, uh, I could put A plus B, and I can say A is a placeholder. It can be any node. And any sub-expression, it can be a, a tree or anything, it's a blob. And B can be a placeholder, it can be anything. And in fact, plus can be a place, I can specify that as a placeholder for my operate, uh, to the token operation. So in fact, plus is just a, uh, a thing that can, that can be anything, it can be multiply, it can be divide, it can be uh, any operation. And then that becomes the reference pattern that my matcher is looking for. So what I can in fact be doing is walking my whole tree, finding any constants where I'm adding things. And it could be two strings I'm concatenating together. It could be two numbers that I'm multiplying. It could be uh, two uh, dates that I'm comparing if one's before the other with the less than operator or whatever it might be. And at, uh, if they're constants, so I've got a constant date or whatever, constant strings, constant numbers, the compiler can say, yeah, I'll work that out beforehand, including the Pythagoras example that we saw before. We can calculate if it happens to be x squared plus uh, y squared square root and everything's a constant, it can evaluate that at compile time and just put the answer in. Yep. So you can go and write these sorts of optimizers really, really easy and the matcher is allowing you to, uh, to, to do that really, really easily. Okay. Uh, one thing, where does this macro come from? Did I import it anywhere in my examples? No, it's not. I haven't necessarily shown you all the imports in many of these uh, uh, code examples, but there is no import anywhere. Um, it's not like a static import or anything. It's, um, you know, wh where did it come from? Is it a, some sort of glo magic global thing or whatever? Well, c kind of. It's, it's kind of like print line is a... Uh, a, a method that's available. It's actually an, a method that's been, uh, it's the object class has been enhanced with a print line method. So any object you have, you can call print line on it. And if I go print line new date inside a script, it's actually the script object that's going to be um, called 
the print line method for that and it's going to print that out. So it's kind of like a global method, if you like, method on every object instance anyway. Macro is kind of like that, but it's actually um, been defined in such a way that um, it's, it's done generically. There's just a list of macro uh, methods that are in a file that gets specified in a similar way to how you would do print line but with a special marker on it that says this is one of the magic macro ones and, it ha and it's the expansion phase happens very early on and that's the important thing for uh, macros. And one of the principles behind uh, designing Groovy that we've always had is if we need a feature in, in the compiler or in the runtime in order to make the, the stuff that we need to do work, if make it extensible, make, expose it to the user of the language. You know, we, we, we trust you're all uh, intelligent users and you can do sensible things with it. We hope, hope you, you, you won't use these things for evil, but we'll make these things available to you. So the mechanism we use for macro will let you create your own methods of that same form. And these are called macro methods. So you just go and write a little, I don't know if any of you know how to write an extension uh, method, but you go and write a static class with a, like a self parameter as the first parameter and then some other optional parameters. You put that in a, um, a, a special syntax, you put it in a special place with a, a, a reference to it and it'll get found and it'll be there. You do the exact same thing and you can now have your, instead of macro here, you can have your own macro methods. And there's been various uh, ones um, being proposed as, as possibilities, but the, the possibilities are endless and we'll see more and more of these uh, crop up over the next little while. So to give you a flavor of some of the kinds of things you can do, uh, one of the, on the, the, the GitHub reference you can probably va va barely see at the back. All these slides will be on um, uh, speaker deck, so don't worry if you, um, you don't need to be uh, furiously copying anything. Um, there's a definition of a match method. And it, so the match, again, there's no imp uh, global static import of map, uh, match anywhere. It's one of these macro methods. So it's just sitting in a file. It's, it, it says uh, this is what match does. And um, in fact, this is now like pattern matching in Groovy. We didn't have, have to add pattern matching to the language. This is a, like a thing like a macro that runs and happens early, very early in the, in the uh, compilation process. And it just goes and basically re returns that match into the equivalent switch and or if then else type statements. Yeah. Um, but now we've got... Uh, something that's a little bit more flexible than a switch and it does uh, sort of a pattern matching style approach there. Okay. If you, any of you have used Spock, you'll know that it's got a wonderful uh, syntax for um, doing um, data-driven uh, uh, te te uh, test cases. So I can actually have a little table of here's the test values I want you to uh, run with and they get fed into uh, my parameter here. If you've got a little bit of uh, Spock Envy and you want to go use that in your production code instead of not in a test here but in production, there's a little do with data macro type thing that you can go get. And you go do, uh, do with data, again it's one of these macros that runs very early in, in the compilation process, it just converts that into the equivalent while loops that you'd need. But your code can look like this and uh, once it hits, once the Groovy compiler actually sees it after macro expansion, it's just seeing normal stuff of, of normal uh, groovy syntax there. So it sort of give you a, a feel for what the, this, the power that's sort of uh, uh, um, waiting there to be uh, uh, embraced by users of Groovy and by all you guys. We're, ho we're hoping you'll come up with even fancier, wonderful ideas to, to use this sort of capability. It's a very, very powerful feature and uh, um, I'm, I'm sure we're going to see uh, lots more things in that space. There's... Um, some miscellaneous features that are uh, um, also in the language. I'm just going to go over these really, really quickly. You'll, um, have, you can go look up the um, release notes if you uh, uh, have got a particular interest in these. Um, ja what Java will do if you've got an annotation and um, you go annotate a class and you put multiple of the same annotation there, that would normally throw a compile error as of Java 8. If you had a a, what's called a collection a a annotation that basically is an array of your annotation. Java will automatically stuff all of those things, that, all those annotations that you put on a method or a class, whatever it is, into one of those, the, the array. Okay, so it does that, that sort of semi-automatically. -autom you don't really need necessarily need to know that's happening. Groovy will do the same thing. So that's all good. Some examples there. 
if you've uh, ever gone and decompiled a Java class, you'll probably have noticed that it'll have things like um, arg0, arg1, arg2, and so on, stuff like that. Depending on what, if you've got sort of debug flags on or whatever, you, you might see something slightly different, but in, in general, you can't hope to have um, any uh, nice names there um, in the general case. Java introduced a minus minus parameter switch that actually retains the property names of uh, the parameter names of um, any parameters there. So you'll see that in your constructors and in your methods. So it's kind of nice to actually see that in the bytecode. Um, if you're down debugging at that level, it's, uh, you're looking for any help you can get, and having some nice meaningful names there is a, is a useful thing. Groovy supports the same uh, facility. We just want Gradle plug in to also do that. That'd be good. Right, work in, in place, annotations in more places. So I don't again spend uh, 10 minutes on this slide, which we could easily do, but looking at the very last line, if you want to have a existing string of non-null, non-empty, read-only uh, items, so an array, an array, an array of uh, strings, then with those annotations at the different places, then you can do it. Okay. Now, part of this is in uh, 2.5, and the, the Parrot parser, which I'm talking about next, is uh, adding the, the uh, extra places where we had to change the parser. So there's more stuff coming. But a, a, little, a, a few of the places um, work now. Grab has got a, um, Groovy Shell has got a grab uh, command to it now. There's a with as well as a tap method. So if you've ever created a new person class and then gone person.firstname, person.lastname, whatever, um, using with enabled you to sh sort of shrink that down. There was basically two use cases that many people wanted. Sometimes you wanted to use a with and just wanted to make use of it and then that would be the end. Other times you, it'd be nice after I've done all the things inside my with that I, it returned the original object and then I might pipe that to something else or I might uh, do something else with it. So there were some times when you uh, wanted the original object return, and other times when you didn't. So we've made a with, we, we've left with the way it was, and we've made a, a tap method, which is just like with, but returns the original object at the end. So um, now the two different use cases where there was sort of tension, should we be doing this, should we be doing that, you uh, don't need to make that call, you can do either way. CLI Builder has been revamped. There is a um, um, version for uh, common CLI, which is the traditional one, and there's also a version for Pico, Pico CLI. The Pico CLI one's got a, a bunch of improvements. It's got, you know, ANSI colors and auto tab completion on Linux and a, a whole bunch of things that are um, extra typing if you want it. Um, so there's some uh, nice options if you want to use that. Um, you can also use uh, annotations to specify your C CLI builder options. So there's versions for classes, versions with interfaces, versions in your scripts. There's a nice uh, blog that um, Remco put out on uh, showing some examples of this, so I won't go into any more details. A couple of other quick things. There's been a few improvements in, in if you're doing Jaxby stuff. This is, this is the culprit that forces us to use add, add modules, but anyway. <laughs> um, there's some extra, if you're doing JSON serialization, there's some extra uh, customization options. If you're writing JUnit 5 tests, they're going to run out of the box in Groovy Console or as a Groovy script. So you can just uh, cut and paste any JUnit 5 tests, hit run, and away it'll go and it'll tell you how many passed and failed and that sort of stuff. You can turn on extra logging if you want to get information about each test and what happened and so on. A little bit of a heads up. I haven't got time to go through these. But if, if you start, if you dive into 2.5 and you uh, find that things aren't quite working, Come back and look at this. Uh, the, there's a known issues list in the release notes. I've copied and pasted the, the, some of the highlights from that um, onto this slide. If, you're, if, you come, if you go onto 2.5 and you hit a little, few little roadblocks, come back to this and it might save you uh, scratching your head for hours because there's some little tiny things that um, you might need to do. Like you might need to imp, uh, import Groovy Date Util or Groovy CLI Commons uh, if, you, if, you, if you jump onto 2.5. There's more details in the, in the release notes. Groovy 2.6. So Groovy 3 is the next major version of Groovy. It's the one with the parrot parser and all the bells and whistles that we're hoping to put in, into it. Um, people have asked us for, oh, gee, we like all those bells and whistles, but some of us are stuck on JDK 7. 
So we made a, a 2.6, and is Jesper still around? Or? He was uh, one of the people uh, heavily involved with that. Um, and we've got it, so we've got a version of 6 with a lot of the stuff backported, but some of the stuff doesn't backport, so we, not everything is brought back. So we've kind of got this, this, this version that um, is only going to be, uh, it's really only of any use to someone who's stuck on JDK 7s and it, it is in the process of migrating to 3. This will help them a little bit. So we're act there's actually discussion about do we just do one more alpha of 2.6 and then just, that's going to be good enough for people who are, have got, you know, they're stuck and they're trying to migrate. This will help them a little bit and that's all this release was ever meant to do. So um, there'll be some more discussion on that, but um, that's what Groovy 2.6 is. It's just Groovy 3 minus minus. So it's, it's, but it runs on JDK 7. So it's, everything's backported except the stuff that just won't backport because it's relying on JDK 8 features. So it's, this, it's sort of this hybrid thing and we probably will do maybe do another alpha and then not much more. Which leads us on to focusing then on Groovy 3. And uh, I've got uh, half an hour of material to do in the next 10 minutes. We'll see how we go. Um, so Groovy 3's got a, a few uh, big ticket items that are in there. The, probably the biggest one that most people will, um, it'll be visible to them, they'll, they'll sort of bump into straight away is the new Parrot Parser. So um, our current, or the, the Antler 2 Parser that's in uh, 2.5 is getting a, uh, um, a little bit crusty. It's a bit brittle. It's using technology that's uh, no longer uh, supported. So we, we know about bugs in the, in the Antler 2 Parser that won't ever get fixed because it's, it's just not supported anymore. So Parrot is a brand new Antler 4 parser. It's um, got a, ho it's a whole lot of improvements um, done to it. Some of those help with uh, improve um, copy and paste with Java and some of it's uh, new syntax. The sort of the um, kind of hidden theme obviously with the uh, improved copy and paste with Java is that we're going to simulate all of Java and then go beyond obviously. So um, uh, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, make make it so you can cut and paste more of your Java, and it'll all, it'll all work out of the box in uh, Groovy as much as possible. And obviously, then you can all, uh, apply all of uh, Groovy's value add conciseness and uh, extra capabilities as well. The next sort of major theme I've sort of called it Indie by default, but uh, Invoke Dynamic is a mechanism that was. Um, I guess started in, in the JDK 7 space, became sort of stable in the JDK 8 space, that um, was meant to help uh, dynamic languages. It sort of helps um, some of the stuff we do, but not everything that we do. We've got an indie runtime that you can use. It uh, actually is better in many, in many scenarios. It's slightly slow in, in some scenarios. Anyway, long story short, we're trying to work out how to get the best um, of all the indie stuff that's there and um, do a bit of replumbing and whatever to bring some other optimizations across to hopefully either, at the moment there's in the 2.5 space, the default um, jars are sort of a, a, a classic bytecode and you have to go and get the indie jars if you want um, uh, indie bytecode. That's a slight simplification, but that'll do for today. Um, we'll either have the classic ones as extra jars that you can go get if you really want to go backwards um, and the indie ones will um, be the default, or we'll just throw away the classic stuff if we get everything we want uh, put into the indie ones. So that's, that's the direction that we're heading. There's quite a few different plumbing re-engineering stuff that all sort of fall under that banner, but um, that'll give you an idea of... We'll be using method handles and other things in, in places that's going to make a whole bunch of stuff more efficient. There's a bunch of stuff happening in the sort of... Uh, making it friendly with the... Um, JDK 9 module system. So there's, we've got some split package things in our modules that we'll uh, tidy all that up. That's, that's not a huge issue. The exact details of how we're going to make, you know, what kind of binary compatibility or source compatibility that we'll uh, be offering, the, the fine details of that are still to be sorted. We've got options up our sleeve that we have to just work through and then explain what, here's what we're planning to do. So that's coming and a few different uh, Docker options. So I'm just going to uh, now quickly show some of the Parrot uh, syntax for, for some of those options. The um, do while loop is now supported. Okay, so the Antler 2 parser kind of, it's difficult to make it look ahead far enough that it can distinguish this between a, a, clo a, a closure being passed into a uh, do method. 
versus an actual do while. And the for parser has no problems looking, looking ahead in that, in that scenario. So we can support that easily. Uh, Groovy already supports the classic for loop, but it doesn't support the version with commas. It's not, which isn't very common, but again, in terms of um, let, let's do everything that Java does plus more, but we, let's, let's, let's handle this case and let's move on. Um, you can do multi-assignment, so I can have, um, I've got a list of two things and I can uh, assign that into two variables all in one foul swoop. It's great if you're trying to do a swap all in one operation. Um, you can now do that inside a for loop. Yay. Array initialization. So Groovy uses the curly braces for its closures. So it's the default, the Groovy syntax for arrays is the square braces. Square brackets. Um, we'll now let you do the curly braces when we can tell that uh, it's, it's an array here and not a closure. So if you go new int array, we can tell you've, you've, you're declaring a new array there. So we, we, we know that's going to be an array. We know that's not going to be a closure. So in all the cases where we can tell, we'll, d we'll do the right thing and, and uh, accept either syntax. There is uh, identity operators. So you can still use the is method if you want, or we can use the triple equals for reference identity and uh, the negated versions there as well. Just a tiny little, um, uh, it's a small thing, but it, it's much easier to read 45 is not an instance of date versus if I start putting brackets around it and knots and whatever, you sort of think, well, how many, is, is there a double negative there? And you sort of, the, um, if it's inside a, a sort of a complex expression, it can be a little, lot harder to read. So there's some nice, uh, simple versions there. There's the Elvis assignment. Again, it's a very small thing. It um, just handles, if you, if you go name equals name Elvis uh, hydrogen, I can just go atomic uh, number Elvis equals, and it'll, it'll be a shorthand version of the line above. So it it's, doesn't do a lot, it doesn't save a lot of space, but it's, it saves a little bit and, and can, it can be nice. So that's supported as well. Safe indexing, so we've got uh, uh, null safe navigation for objects, question mark dot. But if you had an, if you had an array and you're using a um, sort of array syntax, it, 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 uh, you'd still have all of the uh, uh, same problems you'd have in Java. Now you can do uh, safe indexing as well. Try with resources is uh, supported. So often there's better ways to do this in, in Groovy than what Java gives you, but at least the uh, Java way of doing things was improved. So l let's support that. So w there's the Java style. Groovy lets you leave off some type typing information if you want, and it'll still work happily. And it'll even do the um, uh, Java 9 flavor as well. So um, where you don't even specify the uh, initial value for some object, you've got some object that's already declared, it'll just auto-close that object, basically, that resource. Um, that's supported as well. Uh, nested blocks, not, again, not, not used very often, but it's valid Java code, so let's just support it and, and move on. So if I open curly brace, have some code, close the curly brace, that's a different context. Any variables that I declare in there won't pollute the space further down, so I can, I can declare another A further down in the code, and it'll, that'll, it'll be happy with that. So Java supports it, so let's support it and move on, even though we wouldn't uh, encourage you to use that uh, very often, and certainly not very many levels of, uh, if, you, if you find yourself doing uh, three or four levels deep of this sort of nesting, I'd uh, very much question whether, whether that sort of thing is uh, really needed. Lambda syntax, yay! So, um, Groovy has supported the, um, for single abstract methods, the SAM, SAM types, oops, went backwards instead of forwards. For the SAM types, it's supported automatically, automatic conversions between um, those SAM types. So a closure in Groovy that mapped onto a, a, a functional method in, in the streams library or something like that would automatically be converted. But if you're cutting and pasting Java examples, they, they use the new Lambda syntax, not, not closures. And so now all, the, all those examples will uh, come across, uh, be able to cut and paste them, and they'll uh, do the same thing. Um, I'll, I'll go back to the previous slide very shortly. I'm just going to, uh, all the different flavors that you'd expect, you can have versions with and without types, um, sing, single methods, you don't need brackets, you can have no arguments, you can, um, Groovy does a few enhancements, like allows you to specify default values inside this Lambda syntax. 
Um, so all the things you'd expect are there uh, are needed. Sometimes you'll need the curly braces if you've got um, a uh, statement. Otherwise, uh, you won't uh, need it if it's just a single, simple, single expression. What, um, if you put compile static around a bit of code and you use the lambda notation, we've got what's called a, a native lambda uh, uh, implementation for that. Now, what's, what does that mean at the moment? Um, the, so as, as I said, if, if you don't have compile static, dynamically, uh, when you go and use lambdas that look like lambdas from the Java world, they're actually going to get turned into closures in the groovy world. If you go and put compile static, we're going to try to get closer to what's in the Java world. So at the moment, we, so we go and give you a native Lambda, which is a, it's, it's, a, it's a class similar to Clojure, but with a lot of the baggage of Clojure thrown away. And that's what you get at the moment. And we'd like to optimize that even more that, so that we don't even need to create as many classes uh, in this sort of code. So we might even be able to get down to just single um, methods being created there and uh, injected in. That's some of the work that need, still needs to uh, progress. Method references, these are currently uh, implemented as method closures. We're still investigating ways to make that more efficient, but there's instance flavors, class flavors, constructor flavors. So if you want a, a, um, a uh, two-dimensional array of strings, we c we, you can s use that sort of syntax there if you want. You can use that with your own uh, classes as well. Default methods in interfaces. So uh, we can support that as well. At the moment, we support that in traits. Again, we're looking at whether we can have a native uh, method impl uh, imp implementation of that as well. Final topic, there's now additional places where you can do stuff with GroovyDoc in the AST or uh, at runtime. So this is a bit of code, and you can see I've got some, it's, uh, it's all, all crammed up, uh, but I've got some Java.comments comments in my code. And here I'm compiling that up into an AST, so a AST tree, and I look inside the AST tree and say, give me the uh, uh, Groovy doc, please, and then I can check that it's got the stuff that I'm expecting there. So you can now write AST transforms that look inside the comments of, of the Groovy code that are uh, getting done and might do different things. So you might go and look for an at deprecated thing inside a comment and do some different behavior or something like that. If you go and use an at Groovy doc uh, annotation, that will actually appear at runtime there's a little switch to turn it on and off, but that'll appear at runtime. So you can actually embed the documentation for your code inside your class file. So you don't need to have a separate Javadoc file if you don't want to anymore. You can go, no tools know about it yet. This is early days. But other languages, uh, Python and Ruby and other languages, they embed the, the uh, documentation along with the code. And this is a way for Groovy to do the same if, uh, you know, we, we, if, more people, if a lot of people start using it and we get good tool support, it might be an alternative way we have of spreading around documentation. Okay, that's um, all the features in 2.5 and uh, what's coming in 3. It's a, it was a bit of a rushed tour because there's lots of stuff there. Um, there's plenty more coming. Um, we, we'd love to be delivering releases to you faster, but we're just doing the best we can and we're just um, getting those features there and uh, keeping the code base in as a good, a good a state as we can and just we can just keep marching forward doing the best things that we can so um, we're happy for any help and we'll do our best to try to make it easier for you to, for you to help but um, uh, that's pretty much all I have so thank you very much <laughs> and, and don't run away Yeah, we have a price draw for the book. I believe that uh, Jeff has some names. Um, Drum roll, please. And, yeah. And while we're at it, um, please remember to rate the conference uh, and the talks. Now, if you look at the agenda boards outside, there's a leaderboard, so we can see who uh, um, has the most ratings. I hope that encouraged people to come and read the conference. And the winner? Yeah, so we've got a uh, copy of uh, Groovy in Action, the uh, second edition of Groovy in Action. Does anyone know what the nickname for the first edition of Groovy in Action was? I'm sorry? Gina, right? G-I-N-A, Groovy in Action. So what's the nickname for the second edition? 
Regina, right? Re, like redo, Regina. Mm -hmm. So we've got a copy of Regina. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with Groovy in Action. It's, the, it's definitely the definitive source for, uh, for Groovy. It's, it's, uh, so no one asks what's the best Groovy book. Some people might ask what's the second best Groovy book. But this is the definitive <laughs> reference that uh, everyone in the Groovy community uh, knows and respects. So this particular copy is unique, and I think it's the only one on the planet with this exact combination of photographs on it. Uh, so both uh, Paul King and Guillaume LaForge, uh, two of the main authors of the book, uh, are here uh, this week. So we've asked them, and they were uh, kind enough to uh, sign this copy of the book. And uh, that's, what, uh, that's what we'd like to give away. So all of you who have uh, come by and, and signed up for the drawing at the, uh, at, uh, our, uh, at the OCI table out here, we're all in the drawing. And uh, there'll be more drawings throughout the day. We've got a bunch of t-shirts to give away. And at the end of the day, we'll be giving away the Amazon Show device. So if you haven't signed up for the drawing yet, uh, it's not too late to do that. But it is too late to uh, participate in the drawing for this book because so I've already done the drawing uh, right before the keynote this morning. And, uh, is, uh, and you must be present to win. So what I've done is I've drawn a few names. And I'm going to go through them in the order that they were drawn. And uh, if uh, the winner isn't here, we'll, we'll move on to the next person in the list. Um, but is, uh, is Alexander Klein here? Oh, there he is right there. Very good. Come on down, sir. Uh, we need a photo of you, so don't go anywhere. Don't yeah, go anywhere. We'll, we'll get a picture in uh, just a bit, Alexander. And uh, let me see, just really quickly. Is uh, Raquel Martinez Diaz here? Uh, so I've got a Micronaut shirt for you if you would like. Let me give her one of those. Yeah. And um, is they, Stevie here? Are they both the same size? Uh, one is an M and one is an L. Pro so pro her, probably is an Stevie M? here? He's at the registration desk. He's close by. Okay, I'll, I'll get with Stevie in a little M's bit. M is probably better than uh, L. So I, I think we're, we're about out of time, uh, that's so an, I won't hold you up any L. longer. Uh, I think uh, in this room, the next okay. session is going to be. Um, Andre's talking about, uh, yeah, six things you need to know about GORM. The tough part of that would be coming up with the six that I would include. There's